Hi class, I hope you're all doing well. Uh, we are going to continue our discussion today about the search for extraterrestrial life in the universe. And today what we're gonna talk about is what our impressions uh, about what the likelihood of life might be. And in particular, we're gonna talk about something called the Fermi paradox. It is a very kind of reasonable, logical argument about the uh, propensity for life in the universe uh, and one that we have to think about uh, in order to start evaluating our ideas about how much life there is or how much life there should be. So in the background behind me here today, uh, you see a picture of our own Milky Way. And if my cat gets out of the way here. Uh, so the Milky Way is really where we're confining our discussion of the search for life to. Uh, we can certainly talk about life in other galaxies, but uh, the distances are so great uh, that really the only place we have any likelihood of finding evidence for life is in our own galaxy. It is a vast swirling storm of about 400 billion stars. Uh, it's about 10 billion years old. And the sun lives somewhere down in this area. We're about uh, two thirds of the way out from the core in an area known as the Orion Arm. Uh, the mapping and naming of the arms is not well standardized. And in fact, mapping is still evolving. Sometimes you'll still see uh, the sun located in something called the Carina Cygnus Arm. Uh, but uh, our maps are getting better with time, particularly with the missions we have. And so this is an artist's impression of what the Milky Way would look like if you were uh, looking from the outside. So what we want to talk about today is the possible propensity for life in uh, a galaxy of this size. How many civilizations might there be and what do we think about that? Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and start a few slides then. So the Fermi paradox is a very famous and very old uh, uh, question about the propensity of life in the universe. Uh, we'll talk about its origins, but uh, it was formulated or expressed uh, and named uh, after Enrico Fermi uh, in the 1940s. So uh, this is certainly something that is about uh, 80 years old at this point, and it's something that we've thought uh, quite a bit about. So what we'll do is I'll introduce you to Enrico Fermi, for those of you who don't know about him. Uh, he's uh, certainly one of the most famous physicists of the 20th century. Uh, we'll define what we mean uh, exactly by the Fermi paradox, uh, and then we'll talk about why it's a good question. The second half of the lecture today, we'll talk about possible resolutions to the Fermi paradox, and that will frame our discussion in the days to come. So uh, Enrico Fermi was an Italian-American physicist. Uh, he was from right here in Chicago. He was a professor at the University of Chicago. Uh, he worked on a lot of different things in his career. He's certainly very famous. Uh, he was an exceptional theorist and an exceptional experimentalist as well. Uh, there are lots of famous, famous stories about Fermi. Uh, but he's something of a legend among physicists for his ability to think about complex problems make simple and quick estimates about what the answers to complex problems would be that are motivated by well-reasoned logic, well-reasoned uh, knowledge that you already have, even if the question on the surface sounds very um, abstract or like something you might not be able to answer at all. And we'll talk about that again in a minute. Uh, here in Chicago, uh, if you're a history buff, uh, you can certainly visit some of the sites where he was famous. Uh, he worked on the Manhattan Project, and in fact, it was during the Manhattan Project, uh, during a conversation uh, at lunch, where the Fermi paradox was first uh, expressed by Fermi. Uh, but here in Chicago, before he went to Los Alamos, he worked on something called CP1. So this was the first nuclear reactor to have sustained nuclear reactions in it, uh, fission reactions, uh, which are the basis for all nuclear power plants that we have today. Uh, this is a picture of CP1 here on the lower left. It was built underneath the University of Chicago, beneath a, a squash court at Stag Field, uh, which is no longer there. Uh, CP1, uh, the pile, as we call it, the big mass of carbon and, and uh, rods and everything that were part of it, um, is buried here in the Chicago land area. If you go out to the Forest Preserve south of Chicago, there's an area known as Red Gate Woods, and CP1 is buried there, and you can go visit it uh, and see this marker uh, that's right here in the lower center. Uh, on the University of Chicago campus, if you get a chance to go, 
uh, at the location of CP1. Uh, there's currently a sculpture called Nuclear Energy by Henry Moore. It's about 12 foot tall bronze sculpture uh, and it is uh, part of our great tradition of sculpture that we have here uh, in the city of Chicago. So what Fermi was famous for is for something called Fermi problems, this idea that you can quickly and accurately estimate what the answers to problems were. Uh, there's famous examples of him doing uh, this uh, on the Manhattan Project itself. Uh, you and I have been talking about a Fermi problem this entire quarter. The Drake equation is an excellent example of a Fermi problem. You take a few simple numbers which you can guess or know the answers to, you multiply them together and they give you uh, an estimate for a number that you, uh, you know, in principle have no business knowing. Uh, but I will remind all of you, and when I teach Fermi problems in my classes, uh, I like to give you examples to practice on, but I will remind all of you that you do this all the time, okay? And so as an example, let's imagine that finally we are all out of our current uh, stay-at-home orders and we decide to have a pizza party. So you get together with a few of your friends and you are very good at estimating how much pizza you need for the friends that you're gonna have over for your party, right? You make a calculation like this. Each person's probably gonna eat about three pieces. A few people are gonna eat four pieces and I wanna make sure I have some to eat tomorrow morning for breakfast, okay? And of course, there's always the one late friend. I didn't hear about the party till late, so I came in late. Uh, and so you know that's gonna happen. New people are gonna show up. So let's assume you have five slices per person. There's five people, that's 25 slices. You divide that by eight slices per pizza. That means you need to order about three pieces pizzas. Okay? That's the sort of calculation all of you do all the time in your everyday life. And you do it for everything. For ordering pizza, for how far you can drive your car before you have to fill up on gas, uh, for, you know, how much money you need to take with you to buy coffee and, and, and train tokens and, you know, everything during your daily life. You do Fermi problems every single day. And Fermi was famous for noting that you can do this for just about everything. And so there are many classic examples. If you take a physics class, especially from someone like me, uh, I'll certainly make you do them. But the famous one from Fermi is this one called, How Many Piano Tuners Are There in Your City? And when I teach physics, I do this. Um, in the olden days, meaning you know maybe 10 years ago, you could still get phone books. Uh, but uh, I used to do this exercise where I'd bring the phone book to class, uh, we go through the calculation of how many piano tuners there are in your city. I just asked the class for numbers. How many pianos do you think there are? Well, that depends on how many families there are. How often are you going to get it tuned? Well, not one, more than once per year. How many can piano tuner tune in a day? Maybe three or four, right? And you just go through the numbers. And no matter how um, different those numbers are in any given class, they're always within one or two of each other. And the whole point in Fermi problems is when you multiply them all together, they give you about the same answer. And invariably, we are within one or two of the number of piano tuners there in the phone book. It's really a beautiful exercise. If you were a business trying to decide, do I want to go into the ballpoint pen making industry and supply them for college campuses, you would estimate how many ballpoint pens you think are used on campus each quarter. Same for pizza, people going into the pizza business. Uh, you can estimate how many flat tires there are in the US per month. You can estimate how many raindrops there are in a thunderstorm. All of these problems are examples of Fermi problems, okay? And the Drake equation is a famous, famous Fermi problem, okay? So Fermi was absolutely famous for doing this all the time. And so you can imagine that if he ever thought about extraterrestrial life, he probably went through the calculation in his head and did a calculation that tried to convince himself of what a likely number for the number of alien civilizations in uh, the universe is. And so the, the Fermi problem is very simply stated in the following way. So uh, this was brought up uh, during a lunch conversation and Fermi expressed the Fermi paradox in exactly the way that uh, I'm going to express it to you here. Uh, but I often imagine it, and certainly the way I often introduce it to friends of mine, is you walk out into a, a dark meadow at night and you can see the starry sky up uh, above you. You know that you think life might be plentiful in the universe. And the simplest statement of the Fermi paradox when faced with all the universe above you or faced with your colleagues talking about this in very complex uh, ways at lunchtime is this, where are they? Okay, now that's a very simple statement. And they mean, where are the aliens? And where are they, meaning why aren't they here on Earth now? 
Okay, so this is a very simple, very typical of Fermi statement. If, the, if alien life is plentiful, then where are they? Okay, so what does he mean by that? So in order to understand what he means by that, let's start from uh, both this assumption that life is plentiful, but let me introduce you to an idea, a mathematical idea, that we'll use in tandem with this idea that life is plentiful. Okay, and that mathematical idea, which some of you may have been exposed to, is usually called the uh, Persian or Indian chessboard problem. Sometimes it's called the wheat seed and chessboard problem. Okay, uh, but the first time we know uh, that it was described uh, was in 1256 by this Arabic scholar. And uh, I don't speak Arabic, but if any of my uh, students out there listening to me do, I would appreciate an appropriate pronunciation. Uh, if I assume the Latinization is purely phonetic, that is Ibn Khalikan. Okay, uh, but that was the first description of the wheat uh, and chessboard problem. And basically the story goes that the inventor of chess, when asked for payment by the king, uh, told the king that he could pay him in wheat by placing one grain of wheat on the first square of the chessboard, two grains of wheat on the next uh, square, and then doubling the number of grains of wheat as you go along the chessboard all the way to the last of the 64 squares on the chessboard. And if you would just pay him in wheat that way, he would be very happy, okay? So why is that uh, an interesting statement? Well, look at the diagram here that uh, I've, I've shown you of the chessboard, and let's just do that doubling problem for the first row, okay? So I put one grain on the first square, two on the second, four on the third, eight, 16, and by the time I get to the end of the first row, I will have 128 grains of wheat, okay? So you can go down the second row and do the same multiplication, and the third row and doing the same multiplication, and all the way across the board, okay? And so what you'll find is that number grows ever larger, and it grows larger very, very, very rapidly. Okay, so this is an example of what we call geometric progression. It's a form of exponential growth. And the number of grains on the uh, square is two to the n, okay? Which means I take the value of n and I multiply that many copies of two by itself uh, to get the number of grains. So if I'm on, uh, after the first one, the first one is two to the zero actually. So uh, if I go to the third square there, two times two times two is eight. Okay, and you can see there uh, eight on that square. So I've printed the two to the n table out for you for the first 12 values. And if I count to the chessboard, uh, the square where I reach two to the 12th is that square there on the second row. So you can see how exponential growth works. Okay, uh, by the time I'm not even to the end of the second row, I'm up to 4,000 grains of wheat on a single square. And so if I were to go all the way to the other end of the board, this is a well-known problem. So if you take a trigonometry, maybe, maybe algebra two, I don't know where you, uh, you typically learn about this. Uh, the solution to this problem is two to the 64 uh, minus one, which is 18 sextillion, 446 quintillion, 744 quadrillion, 73 trillion, 709 billion, 551 million, 615 grains of wheat total on the square, okay? That's a lot of wheat. And in fact, the reason this story is famous is because the king scoffed at the inventor of chess, but the uh, royal econ uh, economic officer freaked out because uh, he knew that this would bankrupt uh, the kingdom, okay? So uh, if you, you write it out in scientific notation there, it's 1.8 times 10 to the 19 grains. Okay, so why am I telling you this story? Because I want you to think about geometric progression in the context of what it would take to explore the galaxy. And here, the way this is classically expressed is in the form of twos, but it will in principle work for any number. So here's the geometric growth for two to the n or five to the n. So the difference between these two tables is instead of doubling the number of grains, I quintuple the number of grains as I go from square to square. I make five grains instead of two grains. And you can see that by the time I get to uh, two to the 22, I'm up to four million, over four million. But if I go to five to the 22, I'm up to two quintillion. Okay, so the numbers get very large very quickly, even for just small differences in the multiplicative factor. Okay, so why is this an important concept? 
Well, let's pivot just a little bit. Trust me, they're connected, okay? And let's think about robots and 3D printing, okay? Now, those of you who think about space exploration, you will know that this is a, not a new idea, but it's an idea that only in the last decade or so is actually practical and reasonable. The idea has been, especially for exploring places like the moon, suppose I send a space probe to the moon or to Mars, okay? And the space probe can land on the world with uh, some kind of rover that can roam around and gather raw materials. And I can also land a factory. And all this factory does is it's a 3D printing factory and it can take raw materials from my rover and 3D print whatever I tell it to print. And in this case, what I want the factory to do is I want it to reprint a rocket. And on that rocket, I want it to reprint a copy of the space probe that originally arrived both in form and function and computer instructions. So the space probe came in, it carried with it a lander with the technology uh, to have a 3D printing factory to build a copy of itself, okay? And so I'm gonna send that probe to a nearby planet, say Mars, and I'm gonna tell it to make multiple copies of itself. And then it's going to launch those copies those copies are each going to carry a spacecraft, just like the one that arrived here on the planet. And they're going to travel out into the solar system, or ultimately into the galaxy, to a new world. And on that new world, they will repeat this process. Okay? So this is a blueprint for exploring not just one planet on the galaxy, not just one solar system, but exploring every planet in the galaxy. So how does it work, okay? This is the start, I start with Earth. I send out, say, two space probes, both of them to some different location. They land on that location, they put down their 3D printing factory, they each build copies of themselves and send out two new probes to now four planets. And those probes land on those four planets, they put down their factories, they 3D, 3D print copies of themselves, and they send themselves out again to new worlds, and now I'm up to eight worlds, okay? So here, in just three generations of robotics, I have gone from just locating myself on one world, the Earth where I started, and I am now exploring uh, the six worlds plus eight more, 14 worlds, in just two replication cycles of my robots, okay? So, the point is, is that I could do this, and if my robot's instructions are to go to every world in the Milky Way galaxy, okay, all they have to do is they have to know where they've been, you carry that record with you as you build your robots, and then you send them on their way in directions that explore the galaxy depending on which thread of the exploration team they're on. Okay, so here's the two to the end table, uh, but let me do the calculation for you. So we were looking at the galaxy here behind me to start with. We said there are 400 billion stars in the Milky Way. So that's four times 10 to the 11 stars. Okay, so the number of planets per star is about 10 per star. That's roughly what it is in our solar system. So there are four times 10 to the 12 planets. So how many robot replications would I have to make to get to four times 10 to the 12 planets, okay? Now, you may object to that because you, you, if you've been paying attention this whole quarter, you know it's not just the 10 planets in our solar system that matter, it's also the moons, right? There are moons around Jupiter which might be interesting. So maybe we shouldn't use 10 per star, maybe we should use 100 per star or 1,000 per star. That's okay, that just changes the number of planets we have to visit four times 10 to the 13, or four times 10 to the 14, okay? So in the first case, if I'm going for just making two copies of the robots and sending them out, I only have to go through 45 replication cycles before I get to four times 10 to the 13. Or if I'm doing five robots at a time for each factory I put down, then I only have to go through 19 replication cycles before I have enough robots to visit every world around every star in the Milky Way galaxy. 19 is not a big number of replication cycles. You'll remember the last time we talked, we said it took 40,000 years for Voyager to get to the nearest star. 
So if I were to just multiply 40,000 by 20, that means we could send robots to every star in the Milky Way galaxy at Voyager speeds in less than a million years. Okay, that is extraordinary. That is what Fermi meant by where are they? It's easy to visit every world on the Milky Way galaxy if you really wanted to, okay? Even if you use a much larger number, a thousand worlds per star, you want to visit every asteroid, every moon, every, you know, everything bigger than a potato in, uh, uh, in the solar system. So if you choose a thousand per star, it's still very small numbers, 48 replication cycles for uh, duplication with two robots, 21 replication cycles for uh, duplications of five robots, okay? So every world in the Milky Way could be explored with only a few generations of replicating autonomous space probes, okay? Now, there are many ideas like this for which you can immediately begin to think, wow, that's not such a good idea, okay? Now, in particular, one might be, well, I'm a little bit worried about all of the space junk I'm filling up the galaxy with, okay? But the amount of resources here to build five uh, robots is actually pretty small. So it's not merely the amount of resource impact that we'd have on our own planet here on Earth uh, to build just five robots and five, uh, uh, five rockets on any given world. It will obviously disrupt and uh, destroy uh, the local area where it is gathering raw materials, but it certainly would not be a planetary-wide catastrophe uh, from, the, from, from the viewpoint of how much raw materials are required, okay? Uh, but there are other things, okay? So in particular, with self-replicating machines, we have thought a lot about the problems with self-replicating machines. And if you're like me, you've seen a lot of movies about this, right? You've seen Terminator, you've seen 2001, you've seen Star Trek, you've seen Tron, you've seen War Games, you've seen Metropolis. All of these movies are about things that go wrong when you have replicating machines, okay? So, People are worried about the fact that you're going to turn loose this self-replicating technology on the galaxy and it's not going to stop, okay? But in fact, you will build it so that it can stop because why would you have it continue uh, generating robots after I visited every planet in the galaxy, okay? So the first thing you do is you program them to stop. You and I just did a very simple calculation for how many replications we should go through uh, before they should visit every planet in the Milky Way galaxy. So I just say, keep track of what generation you are. When you reach generation 21 or 22, stop replicating. Your mission's over. Thank you very much. Okay? The problem, and the problem with all these movies, has to do with artificial intelligence and machine learning. Okay? There's a difference between autonomous robots that do what their programming tells them to and learning robots, which are evolving. And if you go back to one of the very first lectures you and I had about the discussion of life, when we were asking what are the properties that define life, one of the questions I posed to you at the end of one of those lectures was, think about the properties that we say define life and let's apply it to an artificial intelligence system whose sole purpose is to improve the way it thinks. And so you could imagine that if we were to build autonomous robots going out into the universe, that they would unto themselves become a form of life whose philosophical mission, whose ethos is to explore the entire galaxy. Um, so these are the sorts of things people worry about and fret about. There have been lots of papers written about how would you automatedly explore the galaxy. But this wasn't Fermi's point, right? Those are certainly problems. But Fermi's point was this could be done. Maybe it could be done with robots. Maybe it could be done with a uh, generation of starships, people sleeping on them, whatever. The point is, is it only takes a few duplicated generations before you can explore the entire galaxy, literally every galaxy. And so his point was, is if there are civilizations all over the Milky Way, someone should have done this already. So when I stand out in that meadow at night and I look up in the sky and I look around us and I don't see any evidence of any civilization except our own, the obvious question to ask is, where are they? Okay, 
So that, in a nutshell, is the Fermi paradox. Now, it is a serious question, and when we are imagining there being intelligent life in the universe, it's one that we really should have an answer for. And so we're going to spend the next half of lecture and the next part, uh, we'll talk about possible resolutions to the Fermi paradox and some of the ideas people have about why this might be. Okay, so I hope you're all doing well. Please do take care of yourselves and I'll see you again soon.